I had a chance to talk to Franz de Waal about his work with chimpanzees. You know, and chimpanzee alpha males are often parodied as dominant in a sort of Marxist sense, power-driven. And it's the most dominant male chimp, so the one with the most physical prowess, the biggest tyrant in some sense, who gets to dominate all the other chimps and who in consequence has preferential reproductive access. And so it's a theory of power and social structure and reproduction all tangled up into one. But the problem with that is it's not true. So DeWall has shown very, very clearly that, first of all, sometimes the alpha chimp, so to speak, can be the smallest male in the troop. Frequently, he's allied with a powerful female, and he is generally the most reciprocal individual in the troop, very concerned with the long-term maintenance of social relations, and very good at making peace, not war. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't have, let's call it power, at his disposable, disposal, especially in coalitions, if necessary. But DeWall has shown very clearly that the alpha chimps who re rely on power and force are very likely to rule over an unstable polity and to meet an extremely violent end in the relatively short term. And so, if, if your fantasy about the future, let's say, is motivated by an underlying motivational state. It could be hunger, it could be thirst, it could be uh, um, sexual need, it could be rage, it could be the desire to make anxiety decrease. Then you can imagine that there are ways of interacting in the world that satisfy multiple motivational states simultaneously. And then you could imagine that, they, that those modes of being satisfy multiple states of motivation simultaneously in a social context, so also for other people. And then you could say, and that, and that make that occur as it iterates forward into the future. And then you could say, well, you want to extract out a representation that allows you all those advantages simultaneously. And it looks to me like something, maybe that's marked, here's some hypotheses. It's marked by the sense of active engagement that you might have in a good conversation. It's marked by the sense of the emergence of the spirit of play. And Jacques Panksepp has detailed out the psychophysiological structures underlying the play circuit. It would underlie something like maximal, no, optimized stress. So you talked about minimizing predictive error, but here's a variant. What if you optimize predictive error so that you lay out a fantasy on the future and then work so that there's just enough predictive error so that you encounter something you don't expect at a micro level, small enough that you can manage it, but large enough so that it expands the confines of your hierarchical presuppositions. And maybe you do that. See, I was thinking about that relationship to play because if you're on a team and you're playing against a well-matched opponent, the opponent pushes you right to the limit of your skill, not past it, right? So it's not too stressful, but, but it isn't exactly in that situation that surprise is minimized. It's more like, it's more like a little entropy is allowed to enter the system at just enough rate and intensity so that you can push your development in a manner that doesn't stress you too badly physiologically. Yeah. So you've, you've, you've again brought in about sort of four really important uh, themes here. The, the two key things that you've, you've brought to the table there were, were sort of putting sentient creatures together. So you're talking about social interactions now and social hierarchism and sense-making when the other, the thing I'm making sense about is also trying to make sense of me. I think that's a really important sort of um, and, and challenging um, uh, sort of um, move there. Uh, you've also brought to this, um, sort of highlighted this paradox that, you know, we might be in the game or we might be seen as in the game of trying to minimize our surprise, minimize our prediction errors, and yet we seek out novelty. So I think there's a fundamental paradox there that needs resolving. I think you've, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, in, in your setting up of the um, of the issue, I think you've implicitly resolved it. 
There is, I think, a very simple way of resolving that, and it comes back to this sort of um, isomorphism between expected surprise and uncertainty. And I notice you also use the word angst and anxiety. Uh, to my mind, uncertainty just is a state of, you know, or recognised as a state of angst or anxiety. So, you know, that th- that that sort of um, imperative to minimise expected surprise just is choosing or can be complied with by choosing those plans that minimize uncertainty and what would that look like it would basically look like epistemic of responding to epistemic affordances that resolve that uncertainty so i think that's the kind of surprise that we aspire to it's the novelty that affords the opportunity to resolve uncertainty and thereby resolve angst. And if that's true, then taking it to your context, how would I do that if I was um, in a social hierarchy of chimpanzees or I was in any social setting? Um, In one sense, the simplest way to resolve my surprise and make the world as predictable as possible would in one uh, would initially be to resolve my uncertainty about you by asking you the right kinds of questions that allows me to sort of put you in a particular um, category uh, in one of my narratives my pro-social narratives about the kinds of people that I can talk about but also ultimately I'm going to try and make you like me or make me like you. Because the closer we are, if we can share the same narratives and the same language, right. then together right. we're mutually predictable. So that that mathematically would be sort of like a generalized synchrony, but from the from a social, uh, social neuroscience perspective on dynamic interactions, it's basically aligning ourselves so that we come to know each other and that we can dance and synchronize and exchange and you know after a while i don't need to ask you any more questions and you don't need to ask me any more questions we are now on the same page singing from the same hymn sheet the same generative model the same world model the same kinds of narratives having said that of course there's also in the background the putative or potential novelty of finding out what somebody's not like me like. You know? So, so you know, the, the, I, I think asking questions about the right kinds of narrative that resolve uncertainty, responding to epistemic affordance, novelty-seeking, information-seeking, whilst at the same time still avoiding those surprising states of uh, loss or um, physiological extremis, um, uh, put that into a social context and I think you've you, you know, you, you've got some really interesting questions and possibly a structure and a framework to understand social organization and um, and sort of information exchange and self-organization not at the level of just the individual negotiating negotiating with his or her body but negotiating negotiating with another individual with a very similar yes. kind of body 